All right. There we go. So, <clears throat> good morning. Welcome to ICT ICT four two one. As I said before, earlier, we are doing this in a conjunction of units. So the main units in this cluster are our connect and maintain hardware components, which is basically PC building, install and configure virtual machines, and then configure and test internet protocol networks. So within that sphere, we'll also look at doing some um, networking, very basic networking config and discussion about protocols in use in there. Now, all of this will be using the um, Cisco Netacad course, which is IT Essentials. And on this Thursday, it'll run again for about four weeks. Then it all change days and Thursdays will become the first of the CCNA modules. Okay. So the other issue we'll have at the moment with the remote delivery is we will need to look at postponing the practical exercises. Um, it's a bit hard for me to give you uh, uh, PCs to pull apart and build at the moment. You're not on campus. So at the moment, we'll do the theory and then catch up with the physical components of the PC build for those that may not have built a PC before. We'll catch up with that. So personal computer. First thing we always need to talk about is safety. So we have a power supply to these devices. In Australia, we are using 240 volt AC, which will kill you if you hook yourself up to it. Uh, not always, but if you uh, manage to do the wrong thing, it can cause you serious harm. So we'll look at what parts of equipment have that power supply in its raw requirements. It's not as bad as the old days. Um, in the old days, we used to have the 240 volt coming to the front of the case um, on the case switch used to switch to 240 volt. We now only switch the power supply, which is our 12 volt supply. So it's a lot better and a lot safer that way. But we'll still touch that on and off. So with electronics, depending on what it is, it is quite susceptible to static discharge. Now, it can be quite painful if we've all had the nice static jolt by now, I'm sure. Um, I know as a kid in school, we used to shuffle our feet so that we could zap somebody in the corridor. Um, so for you to feel it, it has to have been a discharge of 3000 volts of static electricity. So just think about what 3000 volts plus is going to do to your electronic devices that are used to running at 3, 5 or 12 volts. It's okay, going to so be well. And call it. Yeah. So it can definitely uh, cause it some harm. So computer components generally come in a anti-static bag. Um, we should always ground ourselves and our workbenches to help isolate ourselves from static discharge. And 
try to use anti-static wrist straps when working on the insides of uh, electronics. Not always practical. Um, I haven't found a strap that actually fits around my um, small wrists. <laughs> When you get to see me face to face, you'll understand that comment in, in its full, full impact. Just think of a young Santa. <laughs> so, cases. Cases come in all shapes and sizes. And depending on the manufacturer, they'll call them different forms. So, basically, you have a horizontal um, vertical which we call towers um, we now have all in one so like your your max have been doing all in ones for a long time we now have that for pcs as well and basically cases will hold all the individual components such as the motherboard the central processing unit memory basic drive units and even any additional adapter cards that we need although most of the primary ones have gone back to being built into the motherboard so you've got to choose we'll talk about form factors and the various forms here we <clears throat> as technology improves the way we power it and the type of connectors in that change. So when we look at power supplies, we need to match the power supplies connectors to the connectors that we'll find on the motherboard. So these are AT, ATX, ATX 12V, which is normally just um, referred to as ATX these days if you go in. EPX normally on the servers. Okay, so the connectors, the main ones we'll have is our main slotted connector which connects to the motherboard, which is that big long one there. Um, SATA, which we don't have in this little display. Molex are the big chunky one in the background which generally goes to your um, hard drives and CD drives, Blu-ray drives, that sort of thing. Um, the Berg connector is this little little one here and that one connects to your items such as the old floppy drives that used to be in cases, three and a half inch floppy drive. Um, then you'll have your four or eight pin auxiliary power connectors which are basically these ones down here and same with the six to eight pin power connector which is used for things such as um, graphics cards. So power supply depending on what's being used will have a 3.3 which is basically your CPU power 5 volts and 12 volts um, they basically drive your main uh, drives in your hard drives and that need a little bit more voltage so all of this is delivered via those connectors and with a 24 pin connector you'll have lots of ground connectors and lots of different positive volt, voltage supplies going through to those pins. So next comes motherboard. So the main areas is our RAM slots, our controlling chipsets, then we'll have our expansion slots for our enhanced graphics and things, the brains, the CPU socket, 
Now, depending on the chip that you select for the CPU, that needs to match the sockets type on your motherboard. The motherboard will have a um, EEPROM called a BIOS chip, which basically has the firmware that controls the motherboard, so how it starts up to get all that hardware talking to each other. And then you'll have external and internal connectors for the various elements. So down the bottom here are our connectors for our external things like our mouse, so our USBs, our network ports, and that are all in this little section here. This slot here is our power supply where it connects. And along here, we've got the SATA drives for internal hard drives and that. And these ones down the side here are normally um, case um, USBs, audio. Um, that set of pins there will be the ones used for setting up the LEDs and all the flashing lights and status lights and switches on your case. So the chipset used in a motherboard basically controls how this hardware talks to each other. And within that chipset, you normally have two main components, which are North Bridge and South Bridge. Now, the North Bridge is your high speed um, interface, which is your video cards, your RAM, and your CPU keep the next into that. And the South Bridge is the slower one that talks to the external hard drives and your video cards and things like that. Um, or expansion cards, I should say, not just video cards. Because basically that's the only thing I have in my ex active slots is that. All right, so the form factors, ATX, it will have some sizes there. So as you look, look at the sizes, you go to micro, it's a significant drop. Then a mini is smaller again. And then your ITX is similar to the micro um, ATX in size. So depending on how much space your case has got, um, will depend on what form factor can fit in it. Um, the pins that your motherboard connects to the case changes depending on its form factor. The brains of the computer is our CPU. So the PGA is our lovely pins. I still have um, holes visible in my thumb and finger from where I stuck myself with a PGA CPU at one stage. Because uh, <clears throat> in the old days, they used to be physically pressed in with quite a bit of force. And popping them out, if you didn't have the right tool with you, was dangerous occasionally. So now we have the LAN grid array, which is basically just a flat um, connected connector one that we, which is the bottom one there, which there's no pins to stab yourself with. It's just a straight flat surface to flat surface. And we use the pressure of the clamp around the socket to actually press those together. Cooling systems, um, <laughs> I've got the passive cooling one with active cooling <laughs> on mine. Um, in this case, I'm using at the moment, I have, I can't remember the model, but I've got two large vertical heat sinks like this with two large cooling fans hanging off the side of it. 
So um, the system before that, I had water corn. Um, I've had water cooling fail on me and cook a CPU. So went back to passive cooling. So the way they work is the copper base down the bottom um, heats up the air that comes up through these tubes and the heat is dissipated along the fins as air moves through the fins, takes air away from the heat sink. Types of memory, so ROM read only memory is a bit like um, the stuff that we use in our USB memory cards now. So basically, it's not really wrong. The um, RAM was volatile memory, which meant that it disappeared when it lost power. ROM generally stayed there because it was embedded into the hard encoding of the chip and it didn't remove itself. With the flash drives and that, now we have a kind of hybrid between read-only memory and random access memory because it's not only just accessible and readable, it's multiple access. So it's a little bit different from our traditional ROM and RAM when we talk about the flash. So the types of RAM can be the old cockroach, um, the dip memory. Uh, I used to piggyback these in my original TRS-80. I upgraded my RAM from the massive 16K <laughs> of RAM to 48K by um, soldering on more dips on top of each other <laughs> and then a little bit of wire solder to uh, keep the parity in line with each other. Sim, dim and sodium are basically our modern day memory. Sodium you will basically find in our laptops. Okay, so we have different types of caching available now within our memory, level one, level two, and level three caching. So level three is obviously server grade. I shouldn't say obviously, it's not obvious if you haven't been around. So, so level one's integrated into the CPU. Level two is normally on the motherboard, but can also be integrated into the CPUs. And basically what a cache does is it stores items that are accessed on a regular basis. So instead of going all the way out to like a hard drive or something like that, it stores that code in that fast memory and gives a near instant reply rather than going through the interfaces. Different types of error checking, non-parity, parity and error correction code. Now, Non-parity doesn't check for errors in your memory. Parity checks every eight bits to make sure there's a correct bit at the end, which is fairly standard. And we used to use that in communications as well. 
adapter card. So um, sound cards, network cards, video cards. We now have all sorts of different adapter cards that we have. We used to even have adapter cards that used to be a RAM card. So you used to have a plug-in card with lots of memory modules on it. And we used to use those for doing, building um, virtual drives with, you know, basically a big cache equivalent to a flash drive. Storage, traditional hard drive, optical, so your CDs, Blu-rays, DVDs, all that come under the optical. Tape drives are normally used for backing up large data sets. They use a magnetic tape. And then we now have solid state drives, which are our um, large flash drives. Storage can be accessed via different types of cables. First one was IDE, which had a massive eight megabits per second transfer speed. Then we had our enhanced IDE, which doubled the speed. Then we went to the SATA connections, which were a big game changer. It went to 1.5 gigabits per second. Now we're all used to the um, the USB 3 with our nice blue halo. So that gives you an idea of the generations on the USB side, but we had the same sort of generational increase in SATA connections for our hard drives as well. Magnetic storage, yes, yeah, so um, you won't be able to see it here, but <laughs> my uh, coaster for my desk is a platter from a three and a half inch drive. It is a solid metal plate and is, yes, I'm a nerd. <laughs> Been doing this for a long time. <laughs> is it full of um, government secrets or something? No. Um, stories. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's full of nothing now with all, all the um, lovely debris that's been covered over the years. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, 1.8 inch floppies. Ah, um, these were our laptop drives. So our first laptop drives were two and a half inch here, and then that went down to 1.8 inch as well. Now. In most of them, we just use the um, SSDs, so the solid states. So the initial hard drive I had was measured in megabits, not gigabits. <laughs> All right. Um, so gigabits. Fairly standard now. We even measure stuff in terabytes now. So, yeah, it's changed a lot. It, and it will be interesting to see what technology does for us in the next 20 years. Solid state was the last big game changer for hardware. So basically this is using the same technology as what's in our USB flash drives. So solid states have no moving parts. They're actually just basically large memory chips that can be used. So they have a case that's mounted inside like a normal hard drive. You can even get them 
on um, adapter cards and the M2 drive modules um, plug straight into motherboards and basically it plugs into a side side slot so it lays flat across the motherboard and is generally secured at the other end with either a screw or some form of clamp. Non-volatile memory express is the new term that they're using for the type of memory used in solid states. As I said, it's a kind of hybrid between RAM and ROM um, because it's non-volatile because it actually stays there after you turn the power off. All right. Optical drives, I'm pretty sure I don't have to go into the different types. You've all used to it now. Um, these things have changed a lot and prices. Um, when CDs first came out, their drives, I was selling CD drives at swap meets for $600 when they first came out. <laughs> okay. Um, and they were selling like hotcakes. Okay. Now you can go buy a DVD player that has write function as well as read function for what, $30? So, I can go um, pull one out of my storage shed out of the numerous things that have one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Diamond does it now and very cheap. That's generally the way with technology. When it first comes out, it's generally quite expensive and then come, becomes cheaper as more and more people buy it. And they tend to release in stepped improvements on it just like this so cds 700 megabytes of capacity then we went to dvds which were 4.7 gigabytes and if you could afford it you could actually get dual layer dvds and then blu-rays came out which went to 25 gigabits sorry gigabytes not bits there is a difference by a factor of eight in that saying, um, and 50 gigabytes for dual layer. So as you can see, if you're doing dual layer on the DVD, you had eight. So basically four times more to buy a single layer Blu-ray massive changes over the years video ports now this is <laughs> okay i started off i'm going to show my age here i started off using these rca plugs red green yellow <laughs> all right back into the crt monitor and then we went to vgas which video graphic array and then we jumped across to DVIs the digital interface and then HDMI now during that time Thunder ports came out um, I can't tell you exactly when in the history because they're basically Mac type systems and but it's display the same, ports. So is I, that the same plug that's in most laptops these days? And then um, the Samsung too? You'll get a lot of display port and HDMIs in laptops now. No, the Thunderbolt 3. I don't know, I haven't had a look. I mean, my last one has 
a display port um, and a HDMI port in it. Because it, it looks like uh, the Samsung plug. Yeah, the yeah, USB-C. Yeah. Um, so I don't know which ones they come out. I, I haven't used them, so I can't. I've got a feeling they're on Macs. Yeah. So any of our Mac users in the group might want to chime in with that one. The ports that we plug external devices into, such as our keyboards and mouse, used to be this lovely, oh, <laughs> before PS2 connectors, we used to have a larger connector as well, which was an 8-pin connector and about twice the size as the PS2. Even in today's motherboards where most keyboards come out with USB connectors and mice are all USB, all our motherboards will still have traditional PS2s because some of the firmware on motherboards will not activate the USB ports early enough for you to make changes to the BIOS settings. So you might need an old cable type connector. Audio game ports um, used to be um, creative sound cards, used to be the, the rage back in the day to give you audio. And basically you have a mic uh, audio out and headphone jack. Okay, and the game port is um, a MIDI port, which is basically um, we used to plug our joysticks and things like that into it. But a MIDI port, you could actually plug your instruments in, musical instruments, into via the sound card. Um, that's what, what it was originally designed for was for our musicians to be able to record music via the sound card into computers. Um, but our gamers just used them for our joysticks. Hmm. Adapter cards for our networks. Now you would get a different adapter card for each type of network you wanted to connect to. So Ethernet, um, token ring, all those had their own adapter cards. Then we're talking about our different plugs. Now, IDE, SATA, and USBs are all generally on your motherboard, but they can also be on adapter cards as well. All of those things you can get on adapter cards, not just straight into your motherboard. So adapters and converters, we will have used these over the years. I've had plenty of um, adapters, normally this one, our lovely VGA, DVI to VGA. As we upgraded our video cards, we didn't upgrade our monitors, so our monitors still accepted VGA. Um, now we've got things like USB to Ethernet, um, USB to PS2. We've got HDMI to VGA. We've got display port to HDMI. We've got all sorts, and then we've got display ports. You've got mini display ports and display ports. Um, so basically you can find a adapter to connect any of these technologies together if you look hard enough. Original input devices. So anything we use to put information into our computers, so keyboard, mouse, scanners, joysticks, um, KVM switches, which basically um, you would ser see in servers and things like that, um, where you would have multiple machines, but using 
one set of keyboard and mouse and generally they would have a uh, video cable going out to that as well. So basically if you had say four machines you only needed one keyboard and mouse and one set of monitors to connect to all those four machines because the individual machines would connect to the KVM switch and you would switch between which machines you wanted to use the keyboard and mouse with. So what's changed? Technology's changed. So we now have touch screens, styluses, um, our, I like that, magnetic strip readers, barcode readers. Um, anything that puts information into a computer is known as an input device. So our cameras, our signature pads, our smart chip readers, our microphones are all input devices. NFC devices and terminals. So our lovely new things, fingerprint scanners, facial recognition scanners, voice scanners, even our VR headsets are now part of our input slide. So outputs, monitors, projectors, VR headsets, our printers, anything that we send information to from our computers is considered an output device. Now our monitors have changed a little bit. We used to have um, CRT monitors. We now use LCD or LED or organic LEDs, which are a lot less heavy, they're thinner, and actually better for the environment. Now our projectors basically use a digital light processing array, which allows us to push um, a light source through the array and project it onto a surface. VR and AR headsets, so our virtual reality and augmented reality. So the differences there is one is fully enclosed and immersive so that you have no visual reference to the outside world. And then augmented reality uses similar technology, but it overlays the virtual onto real environments. So one of the first augmented reality things that became popular to the masses was a mobile phone game, Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon Go, yes. All right, so printers. We have all types here. Impact printer. They were lovely things. They actually had a set of pins that used to impact. Um, some of them had rotating um, what looked like a golf ball head with all the um, characters on it that would um, leap out and hit uh, against the paper. Because the way those impact printers work is you basically had a ink ribbon sitting in front of the paper and then you'd impact it with a key set. Then inkjets came around, which were um, quite interesting. You actually squirt little bubbles of ink onto the paper. Thermal paper was used mainly in fax machines in the early days and then on point of sales equipment. And our latest form of printing is 3D or yeah, 3D printing, I'll just leave it at that. It doesn't, it, you're basically molding stuff out of nothing. 
with 3D printers. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, I haven't got one yet. I've got other um, hobbies that um, take my money away from me now, like a four-wheel drive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, okay. I, I, I take the full drive too. Yeah, so uh, that that sucks all my available funds. Um, oh, and the money you don't have. Yeah. So um, four wheel drives and boats are known as um, money pits. Yeah. You just throw money at them, never ending. All right. We, I won't spend any real time here. Speakers, we all know that. Speakers, headphones, we can get them in wired and wireless varieties. So some of them use Wi Fi or Bluetooth. Um, with today's technology, we are all used to seeing and handling speakers. Now, I've left this slide in here because you need to use the videos to understand what these are because we don't actually have the physical equipment for me to demonstrate with us doing this remotely. So these video demonstrations are embedded in the online learning material. So I won't try to play them here. You can just do them on your own and that way you can start, stop them and do whatever you want with them. So the first one's the te technician's toolkit, which get, basically goes over, you know, your anti-static wrists and mats, how they are used, how we can use compressed air to clean uh, cases and fans. Um, when you're doing your fans, um, use like a some form of brush like a little modeling paintbrush or something like that and secure your fan. You don't want the fan spinning from the compressed air, okay? Because some of the fans will generate a magnetic field because what's the difference between an electrical motor and a generator? <laughs> Which part's <What>? spinning, <laughs> okay? So, if we are applying power, the motor drives the fan. If we're driving the fan, which spin the fan and it drives the motor, it generates power. All right, so you can actually cause some damage there. Um, extraction tools. Um, so this is for removing chipsets and things like that. Phil's head screwdriver number three is the most common screwdriver required for PCs. Some of the newer equipment will be requiring torque, which are our funny shaped um, screwdrivers, such as hard drives and things. I don't recommend pulling apart hard drives, but if it's dead, pull it apart. It's fun. The cable testers and crimpers, um, one of the things I will, um, I haven't actually seen the room in Bendigo. Um, hopefully it has a lino floor rather than a carpeted floor. Um, let's just say cleaners hate us if we make cables on carpet. Because the wire fragments don't get sucked up by the vacuum cleaner. They've got to get down and actually individually pick them up. They don't like that. Mm. Um, <laughs> disassembling a computer. So basically how to safely um, disassemble a computer. Assembling a computer is just reversing the steps. Okay. Um, it will be one of the things we do physically when we get back to face-to-face -face coursework. Um, there used to be a hardware SIM available. I'll have to see if I've still got a copy of it where we used to um, virtually pull apart a computer. 
uh, I'll see if it's still available. I haven't had to worry about using it for a long time. So, as I said, this lab is the fun lab where you get to pull stuff apart and put it back together and have fun for the day, normally. Um, <laughs> so, unfortunately, in this, we'll delay that until we can use the room. Okay, so basically, we looked at the components that make up a personal computer. Specifically, we're looking at PCs, not Macs. Um, the basic hardware components in a Mac are the same. So they still have a CPU, they have a graphics card, so on and so forth. All right. So, but generally speaking, we're looking at the IBM clones with this space and technology. Okay because they are made to be pulled apart and upgraded and have fun with. By the time people start this course, most people have already done this before. Um, if you haven't, doesn't matter. We will go through it all and go through um, this all physically with equipment when we get back into a classroom, okay? Um, this is where you start doing online reading seriously. Um, we just went through 45 slides, so there's more pages of information than that in the Cisco curriculum if you haven't read it already. Okay. Each chapter has a chapter quiz and chapter exam. I will be turning the chapter exams on so that you can access them 24 seven for the next week. Okay. So your task for the remainder of today, well, just turn that off so your task will be to go off and read chapter one and oh there's 36 comments in the chat which i could not see while i was talking <laughs> um okay, i think most of it's solved most of it's solved good <laughs> yeah. Um, I might actually start asking you guys to use the Discord chat because I can see that um, while I'm doing a presentation. Um, whatever works for people. Um, and I'll stop the recording there because that, that was the presentation. <laughs>